Hello, and thank you for joining us today. This is part one of a three-part series, and today our session is about opening ourselves an introduction to anti-oppression practices and frameworks. Before we begin, there are some tools to assist with the full participation of everyone who has joined the call today. We're pleased to offer this session with simultaneous interpretation and I invite you to select French from the interpretation menu at the bottom of your screen if you'd like to hear the audio in French during today's session. In addition, visual interpretation is available in American Sign Language, ASL, as well as Long de Seine Quebecoise, LSQ. ASL and LSQ interpretation will be visible on the screen to all participants throughout the duration of today's webinar. This session is intended to be a space for learning and unlearning and reflection. And please note that there are supports available in French and English to debrief about the content to discuss today and to support our well being. A counselor is available during the session and for three hours after the session at this number, which will appear on the screen in the chat 1 855 529 9463. If at any point during the session or afterwards you'd like to contact someone, please reach out. If there's a high demand, you may be asked or invited to leave a voicemail and your call will be returned from a private number. If you require counseling using ASL, LSQ, please contact Canadian Health Services through Skype. And finally, we wanted people to know that this session is being recorded and the recording will be available after the session on Healthcare Excellence of Canada's events website in the coming days. So again, welcome to today's session, which is part of the Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Virtual Learning Exchange. We're really glad that you've joined us and I'm really grateful to be joined by my co-host, Denise McQuaig. I'm Maria Judd and at Healthcare Excellence Canada, I'm the Vice President of Strategic Initiatives of Vice President of Strategic Initiatives and Engagement, and my personal pronouns are she and her. I'm pleased to be joined by my co-host, Denise McQuaig, a Métis elder, an Indigenous coach, who's been an Indigenous advisor on a number of boards and committees, including, but not limited to, the Mental Health Commission of Canada, Sanyas Indigenous Cultural Safety Training Program, Healthcare Excellence Canada, and was the Director of Aboriginal Health for the Interior Health Authority in British Columbia. We also have our producers with us today, Kelly Ripley, Sheena Powell and Jill Ritchie, who are operating behind the scenes today and providing us all with technical support. Over 1200 people registered for today's session. And we have a diverse group of individuals participating from all regions of the country and internationally, representing a broad range of voices and experiences within healthcare, as well as from other sectors. And we want to welcome everyone. And thank you for taking the time to join us today to learn, to reflect and unlearn together. I'd like to acknowledge that I'm joining today from my home office, which is located on the unceded, unsurrendered territory of the Algonquin Nation, also known as Ottawa, where I'm very grateful to live, work and play. And I want to recognize the stewardship and the sacrifices of the original inhabitants of these territories and to share that I've been learning and sharing with my children that a traditional land acknowledgement is an act of reconciliation. At Healthcare Excellence Canada, we recognize we're still learning how to respectfully support reconciliation efforts and how to develop meaningful relationships and partnerships with First Nations, Inuit and Métis, people, governments, organizations, and communities. And as part of this journey, we're working together to support cultural safety and humility in health systems across the country. Today, we're gathering virtually from a variety of places across the country and I invite you to take a moment and to reflect upon the territory and the original inhabitants where you reside. And I invite you, if you're 
feel comfortable to share that in the chat feature. If you're unfamiliar with which territory you're on and the history that has been built and preceded it, Native Land Digital is a great resource and the link to this will be provided in the chat. At Healthcare Excellence Canada, we reached, recently launched our new strategy and we're very grateful to the over 1,100 people from across the country who shared with us, us what was important to them and how we could help shape a future where everyone in Canada has safe and high quality health care. I invite you to look at our new strategy and our programs um, and opportunities to work with us, which are available on our website. Because how we go about catalyzing the changes needed to improve quality and safety of healthcare with and for everyone across the country forms a crucial part of the strategy itself. We're seeking to support people working in health systems to address racism and power imbalances, help them to foster security, avoid harm, and to distribute services according to need. Our strategy is focused on improving care of older adults with health and social needs, improving care closer to home and community with safe transition, and learning from and moving through the pandemic towards pandemic recovery and resilience with quality and safety embedded across all our work. We're working with people from right across the country to identify and spread innovations, build capabilities to lead sustainable improvement and catalyze policy change for large scale improvement. I invite you to look at our strategy and to join us in shaping a future in Canada where everyone has safe and high quality health care. In March of 2019, the Canadian Foundation for Healthcare Improvement and the Canadian Patient Safety Institute came together to form Healthcare Excellence Canada. And leading into that, there were a number of gen discussions that happened through an advisory group led that Denise will talk about in a minute that led to a diversity in patient engagement learning exchange. And those discussions led to a workshop and more discussions and more learning and more unlearning and has brought us to today. And we're learning at Healthcare Excellence Canada how to foster a foundation and an understanding of equity, diversity, and inclusion. And we're learning that it's an ongoing journey. And as an organization, as we embark on this work, we recognize it will impact everything we do. And we invite you to embark on this journey with us. As we move forwards, we're seeking to ensure that our approach is evidence informed, reflects what we're learning with others across the country, and shapes how we select, how we design, how we implement, how we evaluate all of what we do. At this point, I'd like to hand over to Denise McQuaig and to thank her for co hosting today and for co chairing the advisory group that has organized uh, this series. Over to you, Denise. Merci, Maria, uh, and good day to everyone who's joined us today. I have the great honor of co-chairing the advisory committee that helped to formulate this learning exchange and learning series. Uh, I did that alongside Carol Van Cott, the Director of Patient Engagement and Partnerships with uh, Healthcare Excellence Canada. And we were able to bring together a diverse group of individuals with both lived experience, uh, representation of pan-Canadian health organizations and provincial quality councils. Um, and the advisory group provided such beautiful guidance to the content that you're going to be hearing both today and in our future uh, series appointments. And they also um, spent a lot of time thinking about your personal safety and about the challenges that speaking about racism and privilege can bring to us on an emotional level. And so I'm very pleased that Healthcare Excellence Canada took the advice of our group um, and provided counseling um, services available, um, that we have this available in both official languages and that we've tried to make it as accessible as possible by also having ASL. Um, and so I want to just personally thank uh, Tammy, Audrey, Ania, 
uh, Salima, Claudia, Kabisha, Amy, Jenny, B, Amy, and Jill um, for all of your input uh, into what I think will be an incredible learning and sharing today. So I would, without any further ado, I'd like to introduce you to our content experts today, Ed Connors and Stephanie Nixon. Ed is of Mohawk and Irish ancestry. He is a psychologist who has worked within First Nations communities, both urban and rural on and off reserve since 1982. And he, his work currently includes consultation and community training to assist First Nations in the development of restorative justice programs. And I've had the honor of calling Ed a friend and colleague for the past 25 years, um, where we sit together on a board, the First Peoples Wellness Circle. I also would like to introduce Stephanie Nixon, who's a full professor in the Department of Physical Therapy and Dalalana School of Public Health at the University of Toronto. She completed her PhD in public health in 2006 at the University of Toronto and a postdoc at the University of KwaZulu Natal in South Africa in 2008. She's conducted workshops on the COIN model, which we're going to learn about today with more than 100 groups, including universities, hospitals, community-based organizations, and professional associations across Canada and internationally. And so with that, I'd like to turn things over to Ed Connors and Stephanie Nixon. Merci. Oh, bonjour, sego, anin, Ed Connors, wabanong menese kabitwe tang. So I want to welcome everybody uh, to this sharing that we're going to uh, enter into the, in a few moments that we are already entering into now, actually. And um, I introduce myself as Wabin Obenese Kwekwechkan as well. And I am, as Denise said, of Mohawk and Irish ancestry. Uh, I'm Wolf Clan. Uh, I come from the, both the uh, community of Ganawage, Mohawk territory, and the town of Mount Royal. My mother was born and raised in the community of Ganawage, and my father on the town of Mount Royal, which overlooks Montreal. Um, both, if you know that geography, then you would know that I come from two sides of the river, as I often say. And in coming from two sides of the river, I actually have been gifted in being able to see the world through two different eyes. I've in fact been able to understand uh, the world with different forms of knowledge. And um, that knowledge, I believe that is that comes from both sides of the river, but um, I rely very heavily upon my indigenous knowledge now in my life um, as I come to address and deal with the struggles that we face um, today, uh, specifically in a world that is uh, struggling to create uh, equality, to come to a place of equity. Uh, as we've talked about, this, this sharing is actually speaking to the equity, diversity, and inclusion. How do we actually come to that place? Well, I believe we have to first look at how we think and how our minds shape how we see the world around us and how we see each other. And so I rely upon my Indigenous knowledge to shape much of what I know about what I refer to as peacemaking. So in addition to EDI as being something that has to do with equity, diversity, inclusion, I, I, I actually shape it into what I refer to as peacemaking. Um, and so I rely upon the knowledge that comes from my indigenous ancestors to that inform me about how we in fact can shape our minds to, to actually be um, peacemakers in this world. So as we open, I've been asked to open in our traditional way, which is to offer a prayer of gratitude, what we call in our Haudenosaunee teachings, a form of our Thanksgiving address, which has been informed from my many teachers, indigenous leaders, elders, and knowledge keepers who have, I've learned from over the years. When we open in teachings, especially now, addressing such things as peacemaking, uh, I begin with the sharing of the address because it brings me into that knowledge. 
It brings me to understand, as you see before you now on the screen, that we are um, one human race. We have many differences, but we carry many and more similarities. And that in the, my teachings, it helps me to understand that if we want to understand peace, if we want to understand equity, if we want to understand inclusiveness and diversity, then we need to turn our minds to understand that we are of one human race and to focus first on the similarities that draw us together as one. So I'm going to open this and I'm going to actually share with you some slides that actually enhance our understandings of uh, what I'm giving thanks for. And this may help us uh, to bring our minds together as one as we listen to and learn about what I've been learning from Stephanie as a form of being, being able to develop what I actually know in our Haudenosaunee teachings as developing the good mind. And the good mind guides us in the way to be able to find peace and to be peacemakers in the world. So as I open, uh, I'll, I'll actually uh, give a signal for each slide. I'm giving a thumbs up. If you see my image and a thumbs up, that's what I'm doing. I'm just giving this direction to the people who are actually changing the slides to make this next slide. So if we could slide to the next one, please. So we begin by recognizing and giving thanks for the gift of life that we've been given as the most important gift that we have. And that we now share that life in a journey of life with all of each, all of human, the human race and all of creation. And so I give thanks for all of that. And I say, grateful creator for this gift, a gift of life. We give thanks for brother son who brings the light to mother day so that we can see and appreciate the beauty of all of your creation. We're grateful for the warmth that brother son brings to mother earth so that all of creation can grow to the fullest of their potential. We give thanks and we're grateful creator for all the trees and all the plants that they continue to support our lives and provide for us as they cleanse the air we breathe and provide of their selves to support our lives so that we might live. We're grateful creator for the healing spirit that comes through the Eastern doorway that brings this day gifts that help us to heal our physical beings so that we might live in peace this day with all of your creation. We're grateful and we give thanks for the healing spirits that continue to support our lives in the form of the plant life. And that also provide the beauty to your creation that we can appreciate for these gifts we are grateful. We say, we're grateful for this day. We're grateful for the, the waters, the medicine waters that give life to all of your creation. And we're grateful for the water beings that live within that water. And we give thanks and we're grateful creator for the healing spirit that comes this day through the Southern doorway that brings to us the gifts to help us to wash away the hurts and pains from our minds so that we might live in peace this day with all of your creation. We give thanks for these gifts. We give thanks, Creator, for the healing spirit that comes through the Western doorway. And we're grateful. We give thanks for Grandmother Moon, who rises in the sky and guides us in the cycles of life and death, and guides the female side of life in their special work with all of your creation. And we give thanks for Creator and we're grateful for the healing spirits that come this day through the Western doorway. We're especially grateful for those who come at night in the, and bring to us in the form of dreams, the gifts to help us to see more clearly, to hear more clearly, to think more clearly, and to speak more clearly. And we're grateful and we give thanks, Creator, for our, our winged brothers and sisters. We give thanks for their gifts and the, their lives that they give to us in support of our lives so that we might live. We're grateful for all their teachings, and we're especially grateful that they help us to wipe away the hurts and pains from our hearts so that we might live in peace this day with all of your creation. For these gifts, we are grateful. 
Oh, bojo mashomas, bojo nakomas, wabinobene sekwe kwechka. We're grateful, we're grateful for creators for this day, for the healing spirit that comes through the northern doorway. Grateful for the water, for the medicine waters that they live within and that they share with us. We're grateful, creator, that the great white spirit bear, brother and sister, guide us, teach us and nurture us on our spiritual healing journeys. We give thanks, creator, for the four leggets and especially for their teachings. We're grateful that they continue to guide us on our lives and our life journey. We're grateful that they give to us and support that with their physical beings, they support our lives. We give thanks creator for the healing spirit that comes this day through the Northern doorway that brings to us the gifts to help us to endure the most difficult times of our lives so that we might go through these times and become stronger and better human beings for them. Grateful Creator and give thanks and say miigwech nyawa, nyawa for this day. We're grateful for Grandmother Earth or for Mother Earth. We're grateful for her continued love and care and nurturing of our lives. And grateful that Mother Earth continues to support our lives despite the disrespect and the harm we've caused her. That she continues to love us, care for us and nurture us. And by doing so, she teaches us the lessons of unconditional love. For these gifts, we are grateful. We're grateful and we give thanks, Creator, for all those that come through the sky world. Grateful for the great thunder beings who bring the waters, the medicine waters, to Mother Earth to heal her, cleanse her, and nurture her. And by doing so, she teaches us and, and continues to support our lives. We're grateful for these gifts. We're grateful and we give thanks, Creator, for the healing spirit comes in the form of the four winds that cleanse the air we breathe and bring to us the gifts of the four seasons. For these gifts, we are grateful. And we say, miigwech, nyao. O bojoma shomas bojona komas wabano bene se We're grateful and we give thanks, Creator, for all those in your universe, for the sun, the moon, the stars, and all the planets, that they continue to live together in harmony and balance. And by doing so, they teach us the lessons of unconditional love. For these gifts, we are grateful. O bojo mashomas bojona komas wabano bene se kwechka. We're grateful and we give thanks for your continued love and care and nurturing of Mother Earth, that you heal her and cleanse her so that she can continue to provide us with the medicines and the medicine people who continue to support our journey. We're grateful, Creator, and we give thanks for the healing spirit that continues to support the lives of our elders in the latter parts of their days, that they might live in peace for the remainder of their days. For these gifts, we're grateful. And we give thanks, Creator, we're grateful for the spirit guide who guides us on our life journey. For all these things, Creator, we're grateful. And for those things that we have forgotten, we now draw to mind and remember, and we say, make which, nyawa, all our relations, Thank you for this day. Now our minds are as one. You will see before you now uh, a poll that we're, we're gonna invite you into to answer several polls throughout our sharing today. This poll is to actually help us as we draw our minds together as one to also recognize where we live with in, on the lands that we refer to as uh, many of us refer to as Turtle Island, the upper half of Turtle Island that we live upon. As opposed to identifying where you come from uh, in the political sense, which we often do, we're gonna invite you to think of where you come from now uh, in the natural form of the lands that you live upon. So we're identifying now and asking you to identify through this poll, the watershed which you live upon or you live within. That so we are identifying a number, as you'll see, of watershed territories. Uh, the first being recognized as that territory of the northern region, what we can call the Arctic watershed or the waters that flow upon the land into the, the sea of the north, the Arctic, which we call it. 
And then the second one is uh, next to that is the Pacific watershed or the far west shores of Turtle Island. And that's all the watershed where the waters flow from the mountains down into the sea of the Pacific that we refer to as the Pacific. And then we can then look at upon the, the, those who live upon the prairie watershed or all those lands that where all those waters flow along the flatter land, flow south and ultimately into the Gulf of Mexico. And then we can identify those in the Northern Shield, the watershed of Ontario that runs south from the great watershed of, of the Northern Shield and south into the Great Lakes. And then those of you who live upon the lands that are flowing across the Quebec territories out to the uh, St. Lawrence and the Atlantic watershed, uh, that's all of those who live out in that region uh, and then those who live upon the lands of what we might refer to as the Atlantic watershed or that eastern shore of Turtle Island, where the waters flow out into St. Lawrence and into the Atlantic. And then we also invite those of you who are outside of these watersheds to also identify where you are from. So we invite these, your response to this, to our first poll uh, and to this was a way also of helping us to think a little differently, uh, using our, our minds in a way of thinking about where we are actually from and where we live. So I say miigwetch now to you and I'll pass it now over. Uh, as we look at now we can see this where everybody is from and it's interesting if you look upon it, you will see that it forms actually a, a bit of a, uh, a tree. Some will call it a Christmas tree. <laughs> um, so we have people from all across our territories joining in with us today from the northern shores and northern section of Turtle Island. So I'll pass it over to Stephanie to guide us further on again what I refer to. We've talked about it as EDI, but I refer to it as our work towards peacemaking. Miigwech, now. Grateful. Bye. Thank you, Ed. Greetings, all. Wonderful to be in this important work with you. I'm coming to you today from the Northern Shield watershed, from Treaty 13 territory, land now stewarded by the Mississaugas of Credit. And I have the opportunity to share with you today a bit of my own journey of learning and unlearning around equity and anti-oppression. Can we please have the second poll? This work that we're doing, it really is a journey. It's, it's forever work. Uh, and we invite you to reflect on where you are in this journey of learning and action, right? And doing related to equity and anti-oppression, we've got four options for you. First one, maybe this is quite new for you. This is why you are so drawn to this session because these are ideas that you come to know the words and it feels important, but it's brand new for you. And if that's you, welcome. Or it could be that you've been thinking about this for a while actually, but still feel quite early in your journey. Or the third one, maybe you've been taking action for a long while, but that you don't consider yourself a leader in the work just yet. And I was reviewing the list of participants. I see many of you out there. I know you to have a long history of action in this area and also that embrace of still learning. So where are you in your journey? Let's see the results of this poll. And I see in the chat that uh, some folks weren't able to see it. Our apologies if that happened from a tech perspective for you. Let me tell you what just happened. We have most people in the second position. I've been thinking about this for a while, but still feel early. Wonderful. And then next up is I've been in this work for a long while, uh, but don't feel like a leader. And then about equal in terms of brand new and been in it for a long time. And that's the blend we want, isn't it? That's the blend we want. This is a space of collaborative learning, 
This is the kind of learning and unlearning that requires each of us to bring ourselves and our own experiences forward. <sighs> okay. And so because, as you will have noticed, every single one of these options involved more learning, that's the opportunity I have with you now for the next short while is to offer a workshop to deepen our understanding of anti-oppression and equity. We're ready for the slides. And it's important for me to share right from the beginning that the ideas around anti-oppression that I share with you today, these ideas are not mine and these ideas are not new. These ideas are not new and they're not mine. These ideas about anti-oppression, and this is crucial, they derive from a genealogy of Black and Indigenous thinkers from decades and centuries ago. Any good uh, information you hear today are ideas I am merely translating. And my own learning about these ideas has been thanks to the generosity of many of the present day carriers of these wisdoms, many of whom I note on the screen here, Black and Indigenous colleagues and friends, and especially Lana James, who has guided in particular the lessons around my own whiteness that I will share with you. We've organized this short teaching around a single question. The entire thing's organized around the single question of what is my work to do on, and we've elected to put EDI, equity, diversity, and inclusion in the quotes, uh, but it could also be anti-oppression. And we've used EDI because that's such a common framing right now for the concerns around justice that we're addressing today. So what is my work to do on EDI? And the ideas I'm going to be sharing derive from an article I shared a couple of years ago, uh, which you can access freely, uh, both in English and in French. The links will show up at some point in the chat box for you. It's called the COIN model of privilege and critical allyship. And as we move through this te teaching burst together, I have some work for you to do, real work. I want you to find a pen and paper or open up a new screen. And I want you to write the following three questions down. You're going to be attending to these questions as we go. And the first is, what insights are landing for me? what insights are landing for me. This is not one of those workshops where the learning happens only at the end. Hopefully the learning's already started quite a bit. So get that question down so you can already start jotting some of the beautiful insights you're having thanks to the words of Ed and Denise before him and Maria before her. What insights are landing for me? Number two, how do I feel as I do this learning and unlearning? We cannot do anti-oppression work only from the neck up. It is not only intellectual, this is embodied work. And so we're going to start practicing right now in this session by tuning into what it feels like to do this learning and unlearning. And your third question that you're going to write down for yourself so you can answer it as we go, is the biggest question on the screen is the one that matters most. What are my next steps for learning in action? What are my next steps for learning in action? This is our collective effort to interrupt the idea that learning and education is an end in itself. This is starting to happen in the EDI world. We're buying all the books, doing all the reading, going to all the workshops, doing all the learning is framed as the work. But let's keep our eye on the prize, which is to change the material circumstances for folks who have been pushed to the margins. It's real change in the real world. And so question three is not what are the actions I will do later once I know enough. They are what are my next steps for learning in action. So anti-oppression, I'm going to offer you a metaphor for thinking about our place in this work. And it's the metaphor of a coin 
This coin metaphor has three parts, the coin itself, the top of the coin, and the bottom of the coin. The coin itself is the system of inequality. It is the big historic structure that was around before any of us got here that has shaped this country, all the institutions in it. It has shaped us and even the way we feel, how we are embodied in this work. There is no opting out of this society, right? There's no opting out of these systems of inequality. We are in them, we are shaped by them. The question is how much we understand it. And how we are structured in history, if we are aligned with the expectations of the system of inequality, then we find ourselves on the top of the coin. We get a benefit that others don't. We did not earn it. We have it because of who we happen to be, right? The color of skin we happen to have, whom we happen to love. It's how we are structured in history. And the opposite is also true. If how we are structured in history is that we are on the bottom of the coin, the subordination side of this system of oppression, then we have a disadvantage that others don't. We did not earn it. We have it because of who we happen to be, how we are structured in history. And I call the top of this coin, you know, right? What's the top of this coin? Privilege, unearned advantage. And the bottom of this coin I call oppression. And there's not just one coin for all privilege and oppression. There's many, many different coins that will matter differently in time and space and place in history. There's more, this, this list could go on. In fact, one, a nod to our uh, colleagues joining us today through ASL and LSQ, the coin of oddism, A-U-D-ism. I am learning a lot about that coin that I am on the top of from my deaf and hard of hearing friends and colleagues. And these coins matter. Where we find ourselves on these coins matter because these forces shape who's healthy, who's ill, the kind of care we get. These forces shape and sometimes determine who lives and who dies. These are the avoidable health inequities. And it's not just health, is it, right? These forces shape all the institutions in society. So it's the avoidable inequities in education as well. Who was overrepresented in your class? Who was underrepresented? And in the workplace, as you look up the chain, and in the vastly different experiences that we have with policing or prison systems. And so let's connect this to equity. Let's connect this to equity. So equity, the difference between outcomes on the top and the bottom of the coin. And for this, I want you to do an exercise with me. I want you to put your mind to the bottom of the coin and answer this question for me in your own mind. What are some of the common terms that we have for groups of people whose outcomes are worse because they find themselves on the bottom of the coin? Just do it in your own head. See if you can call up two or three of the really common terms that we have for groups of people whose outcomes are worse because of how they are structured in history, because they find themselves on the bottom of a coin. Yeah, that's it. I am receiving your messages. <laughs> it's terms like marginalized, vulnerable, hard to reach, hard to serve key populations, priority neighborhoods, disadvantaged communities, high risk groups, and on and on it goes, hardly reached, thank you. Now let's move our attention to the top of the coin. What, what are the common terms that we have in public health policy, in our health education, in our advocacy work? What are the common terms that we have for groups of people whose health outcomes are better because of how they are structured in history, because of the unearned advantage they receive by virtue of finding themselves on the top of them. And if you're struggling to think of any, yeah, I'm with you. Even 
trying to imagine appropriate corollary terms is difficult, right? Unfairly advantaged populations, free lift groups, right? Often what get the top gets framed as is normal, compliant patients, but it's not, is it, right? Go back to the logic. What is the top of the coin? It's not normal, it's not the default. It is unearned advantage. And yet we don't have much of a nomenclature for the top of the coin, the way we do for the bottom. And in fact, I'll take it a step further. When we talk and write and think about equity, frequently we don't just disappear the top of the coin. We disappear the coin itself. And what ends up happening is that equity gets framed, our EDI efforts get framed as if it is only about the bottom of the coin, as if it is exclusively the terrain of the bottom of the coin. And that is dangerous. That sends us backwards. That allows us to spin our wheels, invest our time and energy and resources into EDI activities that may well be reproducing the problem as opposed to disrupting it. Why? What are the implications for equity if we frame it exclusively as the bottom of the coin? Why is that so harmful? A quiet moment for you to try and do this on your own. What is the logic here? See if you can call it up in your own head. Why is it counterproductive for our efforts around equity and justice? if it is framed exclusively as the bottom of the coin. Let me synthesize some of these telepathic messages I'm receiving and the ones in the chat box into two, two of the answers. And the first is that what we frame as the problem in the first place instantly sets the universe of possible solutions that can follow. What we frame as the problem sets the universe of solutions that will follow. If we only frame the problem as the bottom of the coin, we will only come up with solutions to that part of the problem. And it's a bit worse actually, it's a slippery slope from the problem being the unearned disadvantage on the bottom of the coin to, to quickly becoming uh, a quality of behavior, right? A, a, a part of a, a deficient culture. No, no, no. Unearned advantage because of where we find ourselves in history. The second reason, and this is huge, if we can land this second reason, it changes everything in terms of opportunities for action. And it goes like this. How does disappearing the top of the coin allow someone like me, someone who finds herself on the top of most coins, how does it allow someone like me to understand myself in this work, to understand my relationship to equity and justice work? How does it allow me to understand my motivation? How does it allow me to be seen? Well, by disappearing the top of the coin, it takes me off the page. It takes me out of the screen, doesn't it? But there's no opting out of these coins. I am part of the system of inequality. But by disappearing the top of the coin, it allows me to understand myself in this work as neutral, unconnected. It allows me to understand my motivation as altruistic, to be seen by others as generous, charitable, or courageous. It allows me to win awards for this courage. When really, how am I related to this work? I'm complicit. I am complicit in this system of inequality. There is no neutral. When you find yourself on the top of a coin, you are reproducing the coin until you are not. My motivation for being in this work ought to come from a place of responsibility, of accountability, of dealing with the real problem, which is the coin, of working across the coin 
bringing the strengths of the top and the bottom to deal with the real problem, which is the system of inequality that is bad for all of us. An approach based in collective liberation, not charity, doing for, one that comes from a place of responsibility, accountability. And here is your first quiet moment. Turn to your questions and give yourself the gift of noting what insights are landing, what is happening in your body, how does this feel, what new ideas for action are coming up for you. I'm going to give you a few quiet moments to collect your thoughts, and then we'll move forward. On we go. Mm. I'm about to introduce some specific coins. We've been talking at a very lofty level, very theoretically. Let's get down to some specifics as we make this more real. On the way in, I want to honor what just came up in the chat box and is such a common experience around the feelings that may emerge for folks as they recognize some of their locations of privilege. That we are structured, right? This is embodied work and there are a number of emotions that we have been socialized to feel in order to shut down progress, in order to center ourselves and our worries. <laughs> and they're effective until we can see what's going on and we can welcome them differently. I'm talking about feelings of guilt or shame. And I have those two for the ones where I find myself on top. And here's the invitation to recognize those feelings, honor them, and then to swiftly transition them to energy, motivation, or accountable action, to not be mired in a place of guilt or shame. That's an unhelpful place for all of us. There's work to be done. So when we tune into those feelings, let's feel them and then recognize them and say, I, I feel what's going on here. This is trying to slow me down and mire me. I want to use them to transition them into fuel for action. What kind of action? What might that look like? Hmm. Yes. That's exactly where we're going in this session and in part two. Right? What is our work to do, depending on where we find ourselves on the coins? Good. We are together. Let's go forward. So doing this work well requires a far more nuanced analysis of how power operates in society than we're meant to have if we find ourselves on the top of a coin. As long as we remain oblivious about these systems of inequality and our positions of privilege, then long live the coins, right? Long live all these uh, systems of inequality that continue to reproduce injustice. We're here today to pull back the veil, to interrupt oblivion. Let's do that by nuancing our analysis. And I wanna start with one particular coin, the coin of heterosexism. Now, some of the language that I'll use like heterosexism, it may resonate for you. For others, you might find it's, it's clunky or elite or academic. And I'm going to invite you that if the, if the language doesn't work for you, that's okay. You don't need to draw on this language. It's the ideas behind it that matter. So here are the ideas behind this term heterosexism. Let's start with heterosexual. So heterosexual 
being romantically attracted to, loving someone of the opposite sex, assuming a gender binary, heterosexual, nothing wrong with that. Heterosexism, the coin, the system of inequality that treats being heterosexual as the only right way to be, as the default norm against which everything else is different, wrong, and to which everything else should assimilate. So the top of this coin is folks who are heterosexual, folks who identify as straight. And this is me, I identify as straight. I did not choose to be straight. I find myself on the top of this coin. I can't opt out of this coin. Society is structured by this coin. But what this means is that I receive unearned advantage, whether I see it or not. I get to walk through my days. I get to walk down the street showing affection to my partner without risk of ridicule or at worst violence. I get to see my way of being, my straightness valorized, taken as the default norm in movies and books. I get to see my way of being in the world reflected in policy and law. Meanwhile, folks who aren't straight don't enjoy those same advantages. And of course, there are books and movies that uh, bring forward positions on the bottom of the coin. There's laws and policies that are changing. Yes, these are beautiful signs of progress. It doesn't mean this coin doesn't exist. It means that there's a waking up to heteronormativity and a need to interrupt it. Now, this is a great time to remind us, am I talking here about good and bad people? Am I saying that folks on the top of the coin are bad and folks on the bottom of the coin are good? I'm not, am I? Work out the logic. What do the positions on the top and bottom of the coin in this metaphor represent? Is it goodness and badness? It's not. It's unearned advantage and unearned disadvantage. So when people say to me, Stephanie, you receive straight privilege, even if they say it in an angry voice, it's not an attack on my character. It's a statement of fact about how power operates in society. And if I'm serious about allyship, if I'm serious about dismantling this coin and I find myself on top, then I need all the feedback I can get about my position on the top of that. And I'll still get the flood of emotions that I'm socialized to have, denial, outrage, guilt, shame, and I will manage them. <laughs> And I will do my best to receive that feedback for what it is, which is a gift, which is a gift. It's feedback that I dearly need. Because who's more expert on how heteronormativity plays out in society? Is it folks on the top of the coin or the bottom? It's of course folks on the bottom. Folks on the top, we barely even know there's a top of the coin. We barely even know there's a coin around heteronormativity, right? It's folks on the bottom who have the embodied experience who are in the best position to offer me that feedback. And let's do it with one more coin. This is the coin of ableism, the set of ideas, the big social structure, right? These are invented ideas that are taken as given, uh, that there is a particular right way to move, to see, to hear, to think. And if the way that I move or see, for instance, I wear glasses, but this still gets to count as able-bodied, I find myself on the top of this coin. And if not, I find myself on the bottom. And so am I saying that able-bodied people are bad? I'm not. But neither am I saying that able-bodied people are innocent when it comes to ableism. We've been getting feedback about our positions on the top of this coin from folks with disabilities for decades. We haven't been great at listening and we need to listen because who has more expertise around how ableism plays out in society? Folks on the top of the coin or the bottom? Obviously folks on the bottom. And yet who typically holds the power, the resources, the purse strings, the pen when it comes to writing policy, when it comes to deciding how accessible our meeting or our classroom or our clinic will be? It's typically folks on the top of so you can see the disconnect. And let's do one more. 
This is the coin that's about the match between the sex one is assigned at birth and the gender one feels inside. This is about being cisgender or transgender. I was handed to my parents as a babe. They said it's a girl. I grew up feeling like a girl inside. I am cis, C-I-S, cis. Who's more expert on how cis normativity and transphobia plays out? It's folks on the bottom of this coin. This is one of those coins where frequently we haven't even heard of the term cis. We haven't even heard of the top. That's how much new learning and unlearning we have to do. Where the top of this coin is not just, these are just different ways of being. And yet one, the top of this coin is positioned so much as the norm, as the default, as to be beyond naming. There's only just the right way to be against which there is difference, wrongness, bottom of the coin. So these coins operate to produce advantage and disadvantage. How do they do that? Because if we can figure out how they do it, those are the opportunities for resistance. Those are the opportunities for action. So there's a number of ways to answer this question. I'm going to answer it today with three interrelated levels. These coins operate institutionally through laws, policies, cultures that govern what we do, what gets taken as normal, right? They also operate interpersonally. This is between us. This is the way we think and talk about each other. And just referring back to the institutions for a minute, these institutions are populated by individuals with agency. They are populated by persons. These are not immutable. They are changeable. We are the agents of change. Our interpersonal actions taken to shift institutions. And the third interrelated level is internally, internally, the learning and unlearning, the embodiedness of this work. When you find yourself, when I find myself on the top of the coin, I have been socialized from the beginning to have an internalized sense of superiority, an internalized sense of superiority that needs to be unlearned. And that may sound terrible. You may think that's not me, I'm not superior, but here's why we are when we're on the top of the coin. Because we've been taught that our way of being is the right way, is the norm, not just one way, but the right way. And that needs to be unlearned. And it's the same with those coins where we find ourselves on the bottom, isn't it? We've been socialized to view ourselves as inferior, inferior, and that also needs to be unlearned. And so on and on these coins go, the logic of the top and bottom work, but the logics of oppression, how these particular coins operate is different. They need deep dives, each of them, to understand the logics of oppression. And there's one coin I want to draw to your attention in particular. It has to do with language in Canada. This um, talk is a good example of this. The talk is being delivered in English, made possible in French, but firstly in English. And so we know that in Canada, being Anglophone, English offers more opportunities institutionally and those who speak French, but that's not the end of the story about languages in Canada, is it? Because both English and French are settler languages. And both of these languages receive vast privilege compared to all others, including all Indigenous languages. These are just different ways of communicating. And yet where we find ourselves structured in history, positions us different, indicates the different types of work we have to do. And all of this takes us to the coin of settler colonialism, which structures indigenous folks on the bottom and those of us who are not indigenous on the top. And hopefully you're thinking to yourself, ah, it's more complex than that. And you're right, because the top of this coin, this is not a homogeneous group, is it? But neither is the bottom of it. 
And one of the ways that those of us on the top of the coin, those who are settlers, people who are non-Indigenous, reproduce this coin is by pan-Indigenizing. Assuming there's one homogeneous Indigenous person. When really we know that there are Métis people in this land now called Canada who are very different culturally, historically from Inuit, who are totally different from First Nations. And we know there are over 600 First Nations with over 50 languages. So an incredible diversity. And then there's the point brought to us by indigenous thinker, writer, Chess Chelsea Vowell, who reminds us of stolen people on stolen land, folks who are black and folks who are indigenous. And this takes us to the coin of racism. The coin of racism. And here I want to tell you a story. Let's shift gears a bit. I want to tell you a story. And it's a real story. It's a true story. It's my story. And it goes like this. I found out that I was white when I was 28 years old. So I personally found out I was white when I was 28. And here's what was happening. At this point, I'd been working as a physiotherapist at a big urban hospital in Toronto for about five years, with a big HIV program. I was having a whole second or third education in activi uh, activism now that I'd left formal education. I had a couple of degrees under my belt, grew up in a left-leaning family, considered myself quite heavily involved in justice work. And I had gone back to school and I was in a public health class, a master's class, and the professor was inviting us to reflect on the forces that had shaped our own health. And as I listened to my classmates, one was talking about growing up poor, another talked about being a new immigrant to Canada, and another talked about being black. And let me note that she was the only black student that I had in my entire graduate training, master's or PhD. But I was lucky to have her in the class that day because it brought into sharp relief something important for me to unlearn. Because when it came to my turn, I felt embarrassed and nervous. And I had a little one of those chuckles and said, I'm sorry, I've got nothing to offer here. I'm not anything. I'm just normal. I'm just normal. I'm not anything. And of course, I wasn't not anything. I was born and raised in Canada of English and Irish ancestry, middle class, and importantly, I was white. I am white. And so how is it possible for me to understand myself as nothing, as just normal? How was it possible for me to see my whiteness as nothing? And I realized that it required an incredible misunderstanding of what racism is, and that it wasn't an accident that I had this misunderstanding. I'd been taught to have this misunderstanding that racism is only interpersonal, is only something that people who are bad do, and something that is only done intentionally. But now I can see what had to be in place for me to understand myself as just normal, my whiteness as just normal was actually a profound position of superiority such that my whiteness was just taken as the right way to be, beyond naming, like cis, C-I-S, right? Beyond naming, just the right way to be. And what is that called when whiteness is taken as the norm, the default, the, the standard to which all else is judged and to which everyone else should assimilate? It's called white supremacy. It's called white supremacy. And I'm not talking here about white supremacists, individuals who are actively intentionally promoting whiteness as a power structure. I'm talking about white supremacy, the big political, economic, and cultural system that was around before we all got here, that it underpins racism and settler colonialism, those coins, that is at the heart of the forces that founded this country that has shaped all of our institutions. And for some of you, you're like, whew, finally we're talking about this. Yes, I get this. For most of us, this is new. 
right? And we might have a sense of it, but let me just go into a little more detail. What do I mean when I am talking about whiteness as a power structure, when I'm talking about white supremacy, the system? And I'm gonna draw on the work of Francis Ansley, who describes it as the political, economic, and cultural system in which people who are white, or who are read as white, this is just a melanin, this is just a complexion, overwhelmingly control power and material resources. We're conscious, and especially for those of us in health and healthcare, unconscious, right? We're all here to do better, and yet we are reproducing this until we are not. So conscious and unconscious ideas of white superiority and entitlement are widespread, and where these relations Domination and subordination from the top and bottom of the coin are reenacted every day without many of us on the top of the coin even realizing. So folks on the bottom of the coin can usually pretty, see it pretty well. And so we have this coin of racism that gives unearned advantage to folks who are white. Right? This coin that was invented centuries ago by people whose skin looks like mine in order to deploy power. And so when someone says to me, Stephanie, what you just did was racist, or Stephanie, you get white privilege, or, it's not an attack on my character, right? It is the feedback that I need, because if I'm on the top of this coin and I am serious about critical allyship, I am serious about anti-racist action, then I need all the feedback I can get about my privilege all the feedback I can get about the missteps I will understandably, undoubtedly make, which I make all the time. In fact, which I'm sure I'm gonna make in this very presentation. And when I get feedback from folks on the bottom of the coin about ways that I have misstepped, I will do my best to receive it as a gift, that they trust me enough to give me that feedback, whew, exactly what I need if I wanna be in this work authentically, if I want to be in this in more than just words. So this is the reminder, it's about how we are structured in history and that any of our anti-racist action can never be a historical. That I am not saying that those of us on the top of this or any other coin are bad. We don't wanna be sitting in positions of guilt and shame. We wanna be affirmed, right, in all of our social locations. What I'm saying is that whiteness as a power structure is bad. Structural racism is bad. White supremacy is bad. And it's not just bad for folks on the bottom of a coin, it is bad for all of us. It's more harmful, it's bad differently for folks on the bottom, but this isn't about the top doing for the bottom. This is about working across the coin in collective liberation because these systems are bad for all. And this coin is insidious. White supremacy will continue to show itself in new forms. We will forever be trying to see how it is trying to reassert itself and trying to interrupt it. And one of the ways that it plays out is among folks on the bottom of the coin of racism, according to a gradient, a gradient, according to proximity to whiteness. That positions creates the category at the bottom of this gradient has blackness, which produces the unique coin of anti-black racism. A coin that gives unearned disadvantage to folks who are black and unearned advantage to everyone else, all the rest of us on the top of this coin. And so let's try to bring this all together. Woo! We have covered some terrain. <laughs> Some very delicate, important, powerful terrain. Let's pull it together. Can people be on the privilege side of some coins, the oppression side of other coins at the same time? Yes, of course, that's all of us, isn't it? Right? This is the idea of intersectionality introduced by Kimberly Crenshaw, advanced by Patricia Hill Collins, important black scholars who have contributed to this work, driven this work. This is the reminder that we need to tune into the coins where we are on top and the coins where we are on bottom. Intersectionality. And that these positions will matter more or less depending on context, time, place. And we want to tune in because it helps us answer, answer the question, what is my work 
to do? What is my work to do on justice, on EDI, on anti-racism, on any of the coins? And the answer is it depends which side of the coin you find yourself on. Which side of the coin you find yourself on. This workshop is speaking to all of us for the coins where we find ourselves on top. Coins where we find ourselves on top, that's where we have some unlearning to do. And a new embrace, orientation of something I have been calling practicing critical allyship. But I think I like some of the language used by others better. I've been learning a ton from Rania El Mugamar at Rania Writes, uh, who describes radical solidarity, or Mia McKenzie currently acting in solidarity with the words are less important, it's the ideas that matter most. And here they are that this is an active, consistent, and arduous practice. This is not a set of tasks, this is not a checklist. This is a practice of how we walk through our days of unlearning and re-evaluating, in which a person on the top of the coin seeks to operate in solidarity with folks on the bottom of the coin, not how we've been taught on the top of the coin, which is to save or fix or help folks on the bottom anytime. And we're gonna keep feeling that way, right? This is gonna take a lot to unlearn every time we're in this work and we are noticing ourselves having an inspiration of fixing or saving or helping. And we are on the top of that coin. It is a red flag, catch yourself. And let me honor the anti-oppression network from whom this definition comes. So how do we do this? Understanding the position on the top of the coin makes possible this reframing of the problem. Because when we don't know we're on the top of a coin where the privilege is unchecked, it leads to an irrational sense of neutrality, right? There's no neutral. And expertise and entitlement. Of course, on the top of the coin, I should be the one writing this policy, creating this program, swooping into this community to say, mm -mm. no, 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 it's different. Here is the magic that we have on the top of the coin. We bring power and we bring safety. And sometimes it's formal power, it's almost always informal power to put something on the agenda, to tell a story about whiteness, right? And I can do so with a kind of safety that my colleagues and friends and comrades on the bottom of the coin of racism simply can't do because of how this coin operates. Meanwhile, folks on the bottom of the coin, those positions where we find ourselves there, we bring a kind of embodied expertise, but also often a daily experience of oppression, a risk of reprisal for even naming these forces and a minority tax. It's folks on the top of the coin that created these systems of inequality and reproduce it. And yet it's folks on the bottom hold the burden of trying to dismantle them. When we're on the top, it's time for us to show up carry our burden of the weight, lift our load, work across the coin to deal with the problem, which is the system of inequality that's bad for all of us. How, how might we do this? Question number three, what are my learning and action steps? They're operating at all three of these levels. And so these are all the levels where we need to resist, where we need to act institutionally, interpersonally, internally. And so, in a nutshell, we need to reorient ourselves. Here's the before, and this is my before. We're talking like the first 15 years of my career before, where my, my, my understanding tacitly was I, top of coin, use my expertise, problematic, right? My expertise on the top of the coin to help, ding, 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 red flag word, to help marginalized folks, folks on the bottom of the coin. Here's the reorientation that we're all trying to move towards in this work. I see and understand my own role in upholding systems of oppression. I learn from the expertise of, I give credit to, and I work in solidarity with folks on the bottom of the coin. And that when I'm on the top of the coin, this includes working to help mobilize others on the top of the coin because they're gonna hear things out of this body differently than they will among folks on the bottom. And all of this is toward the end 
of mobilizing in collective action. These aren't, the work is, is sometimes individual, but it's part of a movement. This is about collective action under the leadership of folks on the bottom of the coin who have specific critical expertise on how to dismantle these coins. Not just anyone, folks with specific critical expertise on how to dismantle these systems of inequality. And so take a deep breath. Whew, return to your questions. Give yourself the gift of collecting your thoughts for a moment. A few quiet moments for you to collect your thoughts. And to our awesome team behind the scenes, could we please have the next poll? And we can take down the slides, thank you. This poll says, I had the experience of unlearning something today, something I didn't even realize I took as given, perhaps, but I've unlearned something today, yes, no, or unsure. And the results? Mm -hmm. I want to honor, we have a big 84% saying yes. I particularly love the 12 of you who, 12% that say unsure, I'm not sure, right? This idea of unlearning, it's new for us. What does that feel like? What does it look like? Mostly for me, it feels deeply uncomfortable. That's one of the signs I know I'm doing it right because I get a bit of a queasy feeling in my stomach. I feel really off. So for those who are still figuring this out, it's great. Next poll, please. How do you feel? You get to pick as many of these options as you want. Let's tune into how we're feeling. Energized, overwhelmed, seen or affirmed, unsettled in a good way, sad, stuck or unstuck, curious, ashamed, Wobbly. Results, please. Yeah, we feel a lot of ways and a lot of these at the same time. This is part of this work. And the next poll, please. I have identified concrete next steps for myself. So this is talking to the third question. I already have an idea for a next step for action. Here's where we want you to identify what level is it operating at? Is it at the internal level, the interpersonal, or the institutional? And you can pick as many of these as you want. Internal, I've identified some action steps related to my inner work to do. Interpersonal, I've identified action steps I need to take that may include shifting power, moving resources, literally moving money to folks on the bottom of the coin, or institutionally, I already have action steps in mind for how I'm going to better understand and interrupt what's happening in the culture policies of my organization. Results, please. Great, right, so what we're seeing is some at all the levels, especially internally, Part of the suggestion of this question is to remind us, let's, let's have action at all the levels. Right? Let's have action at all the levels. And with this, I'm going to welcome Ed back onto the screen. We might call up our sixth poll as well, just to get a jump start on that, which is that I hope that part two on Feb 3rd deepens understanding of how to build new habits of mind. So we're coming back together in three weeks. Do you hope that we're going to build new habits of mind around anti-oppression? How to apply these ideas in practice? How colonization shapes my understanding of who I am? My opportunities for decolonial action. You can pick as many as you want. And I'll throw it to you, Ed, to pick it up from here. Hey, thank you, Stephanie McWitch, for actually 
helping to us to um, challenge our minds because the first of one of those suggestions of about change, the first one that we made in the previous poll spoke to the how we are actually going to uh, create change by actually changing our minds. And that's where it all begins. The external changes will happen uh, if in fact we start with examining how we actually think and then challenging some of how we think uh, to change how we think. Uh, and I believe that that is what actually helps us to reshape what I mentioned earlier on as developing a good mind. Uh, as you mentioned, we will be coming back together uh, soon uh, in, in order to uh, complete our workshop. And in doing so, uh, we are actually then uh, going to do two things. One is uh, we're going to look at what it is that you've shared with us uh, and what you're telling us uh, you want to know, um, which is listed here, which is how to build new habits of mind, uh, how to apply these ideas, how to col col how colonization shapes my understanding of who I am, and my opportunities for decolonial action. These are all things that we will speak to when we come together again. In the interim, we're going to also invite you in between now and then uh, to continue your learning, because we really have only begun that process. We, we've kind of um, created a framework uh, through the COIN model, which you can utilize now uh, to look at uh, how you are thinking about these, this experience of equity, uh, inclusion, and division. Uh, division, of course, is, is a key concept that I'll speak to in a few minutes as we close off. But we're going to invite you to, in the interim, to do a number of things uh, in order to uh, continue your learning. And that is to not just leave this and park it, but carry this, these thoughts uh, in between now and then uh, in different ways, uh, perhaps taking some time to sit and reflect on them. Uh, in fact, making that opportunity for you to just con uh, consider what it is that's been shared with you and to think about it. And then you might even consider then writing something about what you've thought and recording some of uh, what it is that you're telling yourself as you reflect on what it is that we've shared with you today. Uh, you may also do that through uh, going out into onto the land, out as we say, go out into nature. Go out and, and, and perhaps find a, a place where you can sit upon the land and to think about these things and reflect most deeply. I began that process with you as I invited you to consider and to recognize that we are in fact, we all come in essence from the same place. We all are part of creation. And uh, the actual concept that I shared in the Thanksgiving address speaks to that inclusiveness that we have when we think about that we are part of all of creation and that we are in fact an equal part. That's how we're invited to think within our indigenous frame of thinking that we are not greater than or less than anything but equal to all. So we'll invite you to give some thought to those things uh, in between now and then. And when you come back to bring those thoughts with you as we uh, share with you further uh, along these, uh, these, some of these themes that we now have identified for you. So I'll pass it over to uh, Maria uh, uh, to do the closing and then I'll, I'll do a very final closing following that. I'm going to check if my co-host Denise is with us and if she would like to start us off in thank yous in our last few minutes together. Hi, I'm Maria, and I do so want to thank Stephanie and Ed for their sharing today. Um, there were so many rich uh, nuggets that I captured. I was taking copious notes. Um, collective liberation about it being good for all. Um, that white supremacy is not white supremacist. Um, was really helpful, that feedback is a gift. Um, and then just identifying how we can move into action. I think that was the most profound thing for me is to not wait till I get to some perceived idea of information and knowledge that I must have um, to begin this journey, um, but to stay in the moment and appreciate that there are things that I can do in the now. And so for me, I'm going to concentrate a lot on the interpersonal. I'm going to think about how the concepts of patient-centered care are really about that collective liberation. Um, 
and that allowing the patient to be the expert in the room and acknowledging that they are um, is really moving them from the bottom of the coin to, to a place um, that's more appropriate. And I'm gonna think about how I use language, the interpersonal side um, to support others, um, to unpack and begin to unlearn um, and to think about this journey. Because so often when I provide trainings, I will often hear, I don't see color. I treat all my patients the same. And my response is always that I want my hip fracture to be treated the same, my pneumonia to be treated the same. Um, but if you don't see my color, you haven't treated the whole person. Uh, you've made me invisible. Um, and so um, I thank you so much, both of you, uh, for your reflections. And I am very excited about session two. Um, Thanks so much, Denise. I just want to add and my thanks to you and to the advisory committee who planned uh, today's session. Deep thanks to Stephanie and Ed um, for creating this opportunity for learning and unlearning towards action to change circumstances and systems together. Thank you to everyone who's joined us on this journey. We hope you'll join us for part two. Um, we will be emailing out to you the session recording and the slides and additional resources. They'll also be available on Healthcare Excellence Canada's website under the events section in the coming days. And just before we leave our time together today, I want to hand over to Ed uh, to close us in a good way and remind everyone that if you would like to debrief about the content discussed today, uh, or have support from a counselor, um, the number will be available in our chat feature and that is 1-855-529-9463 for the next three hours. Take care and over to you, Ed. Oh, Nyao Miigwech, thank you, Maria, um, merci. I, I close off with this image for the day um, because I opened with images as well. I truly believe that uh, although we can learn a great deal from words uh, and what is on a printed page, uh, we learn even more and more deeply from the images that we see that become more holistically embodied within us. And I, I share with you this picture as a closing uh, reflection uh, to carry forward with you between now and when we come together again. Because for me, in many ways, it symbolically represents some more, some very powerful teachings that I receive from many of my Indigenous elders and from other non-Indigenous elders as well. But um, one specifically, uh, one of my elders by the name of Art Solomon had shared this with me not long before he passed away as a gift for time that we spent together. But I now know as I, because it hangs over my office, to my desk at my office upstairs in my, my home. And I've reflect, I look at it many times. And over time now I've come to see how deeply uh, the message is that he left behind for me, uh, that he wanted me to see and to know more fully. And which I'm actually understanding even in, in much greater depth, having had this gift of spending this time with Stephanie and learning together about what I have referred to as peacemaking. So what, I, what art I think was helping me to understand was much of the lessons that lie within what we have shared with you today and what hopefully we will continue to learn together as we go forward. And that image shows the a child, as you can see, sitting on a patch of grass under a tree with sky, with some kind of cloud possibly, or maybe snow, however we might see it. Uh, and, and, the, and then the background is of course the night sky and the many stars in the universe. And then this globe is sitting in front of this child and there's a string, a, a red piece of yarn that runs if you follow it on from the, his, the child's hand and the child is wrapping it and unfolding it or pulling it. And it's pulling off from the, from the globe as you can see, the lines that we have created as human beings that divide us, the divisiveness, right? It's, uh, but these lines don't really exist. They exist only in our minds but yet we have created them in such ways to divide ourselves with power and control in such ways that we continue to divide the world and the earth that we live upon, which in natural form is as the child sees it without division. 
And if you think about that and you consider that as I have, I know and I've learned over time, especially from my, not only in my own growing up, my own development, but reflecting on my children and now my grandchildren and the way they see the world and come into the world as part of creation, not divided not with divisive kinds of, of ways of seeing the world around them. They, they come naturally as part of all of creation, to no greater than, no less than all of creation. And, and, but what happens in the process of growing up? As we're growing in, 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 on our journey of life, we begin to learn from the, old, the old, older people around us to divide the world and see it differently, see difference first. And often not only see difference first, but as we point out in the coin model, see difference as less than, right? These are what our children also are trying to teach us if we pay attention to them, because they hold within them some powerful teachings that many of us have lost as we journey on in life and then contribute to inequality in, in the world around us, not to equality. So I encourage you, to consider those thoughts, to re reflect on this image, learn from it and consider what it teaches you as you go forward over this next few, the next while before we come back together. It's a powerful teaching, one that continues to teach me and I continue to reflect on so that I can, in fact, discover the actions that I can take to make this world a better place that this child sees without the divisions. So miigwech now, thank you. It's been a great time being together and look forward to uh, our joining together again soon. We'll close with that reflection as a, in essence, a closing prayer, closing thought that I think, you know, comes forward from our children and I've been gifted from, from our elders. Oh, miigwech now, thank you. <laughs>